Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Weeks, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome today to our lovely guest, Jessica Aldred. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Sue. (laughs) It's lovely to speak to you today. So I've got a bio here from Jessica. Jessica has been working as a professional embroiderer for over 15 years and is now the director of her own business, House of Heyday, which brings together her two passions, embroidery and vintage. She is a graduate of the Royal School of Needlework. She teaches embroidery internationally and carries out commissions, which include making new pieces and doing textile restoration and conservation. Amongst her many claims to fame is that she has demonstrated embroidery to Her Majesty the Queen, who was a (laughs) member of the team who embroidered the wedding dress and veil for the Duchess of Cambridge, and has co-authored a book, Adventures in Needlework, which was published by the Guild of Master Craftsmen Publications. And she has also written a stitch manual for Fine Cell Work, a charity that teaches needlework to prison inmates. Throughout her career, Jessica has taken on many roles, including working in the costume department at the Royal Opera House, acting as education coordinator, tutor, assessor and studio embroiderer for the Royal School of Needlework and teaching at the Victorian Albert Museum as part of their exhibition, Frida Kahlo, Making Herself Up. Jessica has recently been appointed as textile specialist for auction house Elstob and Elstob, and she lives in West Yorkshire and is expecting her first baby in June. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Links. I'll do that before I forget. So Jessica's website is houseofheyday.co.uk. You'll find her on Facebook as House of Heyday, and that's hay spelled H-E-Y-D-A-Y. Instagram. She's in there, two places, House of Heyday Embroidery and House of Heyday Vintage. And email is houseofheyday at outlook.com. And obviously, as usual, all of those links are on Jessica's episode on stitcherystories.com. And you can see some images of her lovely work. And yeah, find us on Instagram and Facebook and, and all the rest of it. Right. So there we are. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you very much. It's lovely to finally talk to you. <laughs> I know, we, we won't say how long we've been trying to get this organised. Projects and babies and all sorts getting in the way. <laughs> you you name it, it's happened. Right, anyway, so um, before we get to embroiled in your stitchery story today, Jessica, would you just like to share with us what you are working on and what's got you excited? Sure. Um, Well, at the moment, we are, of course, in coronavirus lockdown, which is actually giving me some valuable time to focus on doing embroidery and and looking at different ways of uh, providing services online, which is which I'm finding really interesting and exciting. Yeah. Um, So at the moment, I'm, I'm just about to complete one private commission, which is a piece of embroidery from 1715, which I've conserved. Wow, um, seven, 1715, crikey. 1715, um, and it's, I believe it's it's a morning embroidery, as in morning um, for death rather yeah, than yeah. the beginning of the day. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's got a, a name and a date on it, yep, 1715. So I'm just, just finishing off conserving and mounting that for a private client. Yeah. And then I'm also doing two commissions for a company called History Wardrobe. Don't know if you've oh, ever heard right. of them. Yes, too. yes. Um, so History Wardrobe is the is the brainchild of a lady called Lucy Adlington, who That's is right. a costume historian. Yeah, she's done some talks. Um, I've been to one of her talks. For oh, being, have you? Our uh, Yorkshire and Humber regional day, one or yes. if not two, actually. Yeah, yeah, Lucy. Yeah, she's incredibly talented and knowledgeable and lovely. And her, I I almost don't want to say too much about her talks and presentations. Anybody who's listening who who can get to a history wardrobe presentation, I can't recommend them highly enough. Brilliant. All I'm going to say is that Lucy brings history to life. Yes, yes. Not quite what you might expect (laughs) 
from a talk about well Victorian fashion was the first one that I went to yeah um so I I went to um, one of Lucy's presentations became friends with her over time and and she has a huge collection of vintage and antique textiles and costumes so when she's writing a new presentation she will often ask me to restore or conserve pieces um, oh, right. a- ahead of using them in the presentation so yeah. I've got two pieces to do for her at the moment also as I mentioned I'm looking at offering more services online as we all are at the mm-hmm. moment and one of the things that I feel very passionate about is helping people who do embroidery whether they've been formally trained or not to generate an income from it if that's the direction they want to go in yeah so the first part of that process for me is writing what I'm calling a consultation package um, about producing kits so right from kind of the beginning (sighs) stages of the design and the ideas right through writing instructions sourcing materials packaging kits selling them online teaching classes that's all included in this consultation package yeah and I'm hoping that once I've written that one it will naturally kind of flow into other packages so somebody has already asked me about um, how to kind of get and and manage doing commissions so supporting and helping other people to do those things is something that I would get a lot of enjoyment from um, and I'm very passionate about kind of making the embroidery world bigger and supporting it and supporting other people and um, so I'm very excited about about kind of going that route at the moment and then of course as you mentioned I'm currently making the best thing I've ever made in my life (laughs) yes very unexpected but having a baby well, I'm 34 weeks pregnant now, so she'll be with us, oh my God, hopefully in the next six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a strange time to be um, pregnant and having babies as well. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but I'm quite quite safe at home and being very well looked after. <laughs> oh, oh, that's smashing. Do you know, that's all just absolutely fascinating on, on many levels. Sorting out a piece of embroidery that's 300 years old. I mean, crikey, did you even dare touch the damn thing? I would have... I would, <laughs> We'd all be terrified <laughs> doing something like that. I know you know what you're doing. It's a different thing altogether, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> no, that's not what I was going to say. I, I mean, I do know what I'm doing. I think yeah, I'm doing yeah. right. But no, what I was going to say was, I know we're going to talk about the royal wedding dress later, but if I can touch a royal wedding dress, I can touch anything. <laughs> like, that was probably the scariest thing that I was <laughs> yes. like, oh my God, this is for, you know, Catherine Middleton's wedding. Yeah, no, no pressure um, there. <laughs> Sometimes if something is really delicate, there is an element of fear going into it, especially in that moment when you take it out of its frame Mm. and it's and it becomes vulnerable and you think, you know, the silk is deteriorating, I'm gonna sneeze and it's gonna disappear. (laughs) But you know, there's always a way of kind of approaching things sympathetically and and making sure that you you protect whatever you're working on. Yeah. And I think as well, what you've just raised there about supporting other artists Mm. supporting people who want to make a living out of embroidery Mm. because at the end of the day a lot of people do make the living out of embroidery in various shape ways and forms and people all some people do it in similar ways to each other others do it in different ways you know and it's, it's like anything you know what what works for you and your particular situation what I found particularly interesting was how you focused in there and again this is back down to a kind of a niche package kind of offering Mm -hmm. is is helping people to think about offering kits because it's like so many things and I get this with the online world and software and all the rest of it it's things would appear to be simple oh anyone can knock, Mm -hmm. knock knock up a kit well yes anybody can knock up a kit however if you're going to do something that's going to be of value, that has value, that is going to be a commercial asset, et cetera, et cetera, uh, there's a lot of lessons learned in there, mm. I am sure, where people think, you know, if I wish I'd known X, Y, Z before I launched off my yeah. first kit. Um, so, I, so I think that is particularly fascinating. Um, and I don't think I've come across anything anywhere 
like that yeah. um, to help you, you know, come along with the practicalities of, of doing that. And that's yeah. very sim- uh, similar idea to what I'm doing with online stuff. You know, yes. I've, I've done the um, how to get online with Zoom course and I did a quick Facebook live yesterday, which I'm going to turn into a, a quick episode of this. So actually people would have mm. heard that before this goes out, which is explaining where I'm going with my business. And this podcast is going to be central to my mm. business now rather than yeah. being stuck on the side. And yes, folks, you will be hearing more from me about helping textile artists to get themselves online a similar kind of thing in, in fact Jessica do you know what I think we need to have another conversation don't we absolutely absolutely <laughs> and you know you're so right in this there's so many people out there already generating an income from their embroidery but I think that there's probably a huge amount of people as well who don't know where to start or exactly. who don't have the confidence yes, yes yes and that's where I come in and that's what that's Brilliant. something that I feel very passionate about supporting people and giving them not only the skills and the tools that they need to go in whatever direction they want to go in, but, but giving them that confidence as well right. and, and kind of guidance at every step of the way. Yeah, yeah. That's yes, we definitely fabulous. do need to have more yeah. conversations. <laughs> <laughs> hey, watch out, folks. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's just all wonderful. And uh, the other thing I was just going to say is, so, yes, baby's coming along in a, in a short Ooh. few weeks of time, but in diversifying your yes. services away from always being stuck with a needle and thread, mm-hmm. that's a good move, I will say, from a business point of view as well, is that developing information and packages like that is sometimes the sort of thing you can fit in easily between baby being asleep rather than thinking yes. right I've got to pick this stitching up now right where was I what was I doing you know you kind of yeah. lose that creative thread whereas some other kind of work can often be fitted in and that's from me who's fitted in my work my online work in between having a baby and coping with him on my own etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's just yeah. a bit of um voice of experience there so yes. for me it's yeah. easier to fit online work and bits of paper work rather than picking up stitching and needles and kids crawling around and wanting to play with scissors and needles and all the rest of it <laughs> yeah but it but it also is it, the, the lockdown is kind of weirdly you know the timing timing of it is weirdly convenient for me because yes. in kind of being pushed into thinking of other mm. ways of working and doing more online yeah just generally I'll be able to fit more around the baby and staying yes. at home yes but also I think that what's currently happening online in terms of so much more content being readily available so many more online courses you know videos youtube facebook instagram lives there's just so much going on now and has you know that started up since the lockdown began and i think that it there might be a a sense of that kind of calming down a little bit when we get back to some sort of normality Mm. but i think that it's it's going to continue as well and that a lot more will be done online Yes, with, with, without a doubt. And it's great to be able to work with, you know, my second client has just come along for the consultation service. She's in America. It yeah. doesn't matter that we don't live in the same place. Yeah, no, no not at all. In fact, people laugh when I've been doing this for 10 years, various sorts of online marketing and online support, creating courses, whatever. But most of my clients, so my business has been entirely virtual. And even, mm. you know, most of them, I've had a lot in America. I've had people in Canada. Yeah. Australia, New Zealand, you name it, I've had clients there and very few locally and even the kind of two or three local ones, I didn't actually meet them. We used to do Zooms and things, but, you know, we didn't nip round to each other's house or office because what was the point? You know, it's just a waste yeah. of time. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it can it can be done. You just need to trust that it can be done and find a way. It's strange but exciting times. Yeah, it is. It is. And, I think we've both found the silver lining to this um, yes. particular nightmare as well. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. I usually ask about how you first got interested in embroidery and textile art. Now, obviously, mm-hmm. we know that you've gone down the Royal School of Needlework route. Well, there is a story there that precedes that. I mean, I've ever, even when I was a little girl, I loved little things like beads and buttons. Yeah. Um, and my mum wrote a diary when I was little. And there's, there's an entry, I think it's from 1988, 
in which she says that I'm asking granddad for a sewing machine, of which I have no recollection of, but it proves to me that that interest was always there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and my mum's always done embroidery and sewing and knitting. Yeah. And when it when I reached the age of thinking about going to university, I decided not to go to university at that time because I knew that I wanted to do something artistic. Oh, right. um, and I knew that if I went and did, which seems in hindsight like a very mature decision, mm. but I knew if I went and did fine art or, or fashion or whatever I chose to do, the chances of getting a job at the end of that are slim to none. Yeah. Um, you know, I know that there are lots of people who go and do degrees and have incredibly successful careers, but there are a hell of a lot who struggle or, or don't as well. I mean, I think there's thousands of graduates yeah. for a handful of jobs yes, and yes. It's, it's very difficult. So I decided not to go to university at mm-hmm. that time. My dad was furious with me at the time. <laughs> and then my mum took me to the knitting and stitching show. Yeah. In um, We were down south then, so it would have been the Alexandra Palace one, the London yeah. one. And the RSN had a stand. And she said, why don't, back then we had the apprenticeship. So they took, a, we trained for three years and they took on six to eight students in a year group. Yeah. And she said, why don't you apply to do the apprenticeship at the Royal School of Needlework? And my initial reaction, and I really hope I don't offend anybody when I say this, but I was, I was 18 and this yeah. is what I thought. My initial reaction was, don't be ridiculous, embroideries for old ladies. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went away and thought about yeah, it and yeah. thought, actually, I am interested in textiles and yeah. embroidery. And because there's so few people who graduate from the apprenticeship, it yeah. give me a bank of technical skills, which very few other people have. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I applied, never thinking that I would get in. Still not entirely sure how I did. <laughs> Maybe there wasn't many applications like it. <laughs> that was back in 2001. Yeah. So that's how it all started, really. Right. Yeah. So, so you were one of those young young ones who went down the um, yes. chose the the Royal School of Needlework. I was I was nineteen. Yeah. When I started. Wow. Yeah. Wow. What? A, but what an experience, though, and what a oh, fabulous place God. to do it. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. Yes. I mean, I live in Yorkshire now, but yeah. I still I still go back. I mean, I still do a lot of work for the RSN and yeah. and. On the occasions when I go back and I walk into Hampton Court Palace, I still have that prickly yeah. sense of oh, just the do. magic yeah, of the palace. Yeah, I yeah. still love it even after all these years. Yeah. Oh, that's 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 brilliant. That so so, uh, so then I'm going to ask you after you kind of did the Royal School of Needlework thing, mm-hmm. what what was it that you then decided that you were you were going to make this your your living you were going to give give that a go so during my the third year of my apprenticeship we had to go and do a work experience placement yes and I went and spent two weeks working in the costume department at the Royal Opera House and my interest way beyond ever doing the apprenticeship my in- interest kind of from an artistic point of view always leaned towards fashion and costumes and right. still does yeah um so going and have and spending two weeks backstage at the Royal Opera House working on costumes for it's an opera called Faust so it's based yeah. on Dr Faustus I mean it just blew my mind yeah. and opened my eyes to this whole world of costume and yeah. ballet and opera and music telly and, and films and everything yeah oh yeah. my wow. god and I was just absolutely blown away about yeah. by it and yeah um so I decided at that point I was going to get a job at the Royal Opera House upon graduating and I remember going for a, the interview for the job that I did did eventually get and basically saying to them I'm, I'm not going to go away, so <laughs> if you don't give me this job, I'll be back. Yeah, yeah. Also, if you want me to clean the toilets, that's fine. <laughs> I was just so focused on that was where I wanted to be, and, and that is eventually where I ended up for three years. Fabulous. So there we are, look, determination. Right, so you're all going to kill yourself laughing now. So one of the work experience, of course, I, I did a business studies degree, and yeah. my first, I did a, what in those days, I don't do them anymore, a thin sandwich. So we did two lots of six-month placements. And my first placement 
wasn't anywhere lovely like the Royal Opera House. No, my placement was at the British Nuclear Fuels Reprocessing Plant at Sellafield in Cumbria. (laughs) There we are. I had six months in a nuclear fuels reprocessing plant. (laughs) Well, it's funny you say that because my first ever work experience experience was when I was 16 and I told the careers people at school that I wanted to do something artistic and they sent me to a denture clinic. (laughs) (laughs) I went from denture clinic to Royal Opera House. (laughs) Oh dear! Do you know you can laugh, can't you? When you when you, when you think about the circuitous path that life is involved, <laughs> brilliant. So, um, okay, so moving from the dentures, then what uh, what would you say are your main inspirations, Jessica? So I have to say, my mum. First yeah. of all, first and foremost, you know, without mum's influence as I was growing up and her taking me to the knitting and stitching show and suggesting that I apply to go to the RSN. Yeah. None of none of the last 20 years yeah. or her yeah. life w- would have happened, you know, no. if she hadn't kind of set those wheels in motion. And at the moment, um, I'm, I'm living with my parents um, sort of in anticipation of having a baby. And mum and I, during the lockdown, spend quite a lot of, of the afternoons sewing together in the conservatory. Oh, lovely. And yeah. it's lovely to be with mm. her and have that, you know have that kind of creative bounce with with somebody else as well so she's a big part of what I do yeah um I have to say as well one of my biggest inspirations is other RSN tutors right yeah and beyond that you know I love just sitting on Pinterest and, (laughs) and and writing in you know freehand embroidery or I don't know ribbon and roll a tech particular technique whatever and seeing what's out there and what people are doing um but just going back to my fellow RSNers there are a kind of handful of individuals who taught me on the apprenticeship who I really look up to and admire their work and respect them and and what they do um Jenny Aidan Christie is one of them yeah Becky Hogg um Nicola Jarvis Marg Deer Mandy Ewing like they were my oh what's the word that I'm looking for not superiors but you know they were they were the kind of my my teachers my mentors when I did mentors, my apprenticeship yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and I've always just really really looked up to them yeah. um another sort of big influence for me has been fashion and costume as I've mentioned yeah and particularly vintage yeah yeah so, so, where, so where's that come from then because it's part of it's, you've like combined them haven't you really as well uh, which is an yeah. interesting thing I was going to kind of yeah. get on to that um but we might as well talk about it now well, since you've mentioned yeah. it <laughs> it so, fits it fits in this question it's easy yeah <laughs> so my business house of heyday is a bringing together of my two passions yeah um embroidery and vintage the vintage thing has come from again my parents influence because they're big antique collectors ah. always have been so I've grown up in a house full of antiques right appreciating old things going to auctions you know I've I've, I've grown up and they they collect fine art and silver and jewelry as well so I've grown up with all of those influences around me um and I think that's probably where my interest in vintage came from that together with my interest in fashion yeah um yeah. and and so over the years I've dabbled in buying and selling vintage clothing and accessories oh. um and then a couple of years ago I came across a company called Le Q Vintage Salons right and my mum actually originally was a hairdresser so I physically grew up in a hairdressing salon <laughs> um and so I I've, I've learned from her over the years and I've always been quite good at doing my own hair and makeup but then I discovered Le Q and they offered me a traineeship in doing vintage hair and makeup oh, right. so I've been doing that now for a couple of years and I gradually kind of learned from them and built it up over time so you know I started off kind of doing quite simple updos um, and now I've I've got on to doing weddings, which is kind of the, <laughs> the top of top of you know yeah. the game really when yeah, it comes yeah. to doing hair and makeup. Um, and and it probably feels maybe to some other people like those two uh, worlds don't necessarily match or collide, but for me they really do yeah. because on the embroidery side of things, a lot of my designs are kind of vintage 
inspired or influenced yeah right yeah. Um, and I love restoring vintage wedding dresses and garments mm-hmm. as well that's one of my favorite things to do yeah. and then on the vintage side of things obviously I do the hair and makeup but I also give talks and presentations about vintage fashions and it all kind of merges together for me um so yeah vintage fashion and styling is is an influence on both sides of the business really it comes into the embroidery side of things for me as well yeah and that's interesting that with that background then you've obviously as you say built that relationship up with um lucy in in history wardrobe as well so yeah i think one of the things that we start to realize as we gain confidence in our business journey is that a most things are under our nose and b there's no rules if we want to create a business which combines embroidery and vintage styling, then we can because it's us. We're the person in the centre. We're the one with the interest and the passion and we're yeah. the one who can make it work for ourselves. And that comes back to your point about encouraging people to be confident. Yes, absolutely. And also helping people to find that I'm going to use a a kind of corporate term now and I hate myself a little bit for it, but helping people to find their unique selling point. Well, it's true. You know, what what makes them feel excited and passionate. And for me, it's the vintage thing and it's it's the putting together of the vintage, the embroidery that makes what I do quite different to what other people do. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And, uh, you know, I've been having quite a lot of conversations around this recently myself where I've realized that the thing that's under my nose that combines Mm -hmm. the things that I love to do which is on one side is embroidery and text and that's my hobby I've got my podcast and then I'm like Mrs Technical who who writes online courses about things and has got this background in technology and training and I thought hey do you know what Sue you can combine those (laughs) Yes. And hang it all off my podcast. So that, you know, again, everyone watch out. That's where that's where I'm going. And that would yeah. appear a strange thing to do. But it's back down to being unique and a niche. And I'm well placed to serve those people who yes. want to create a career in embroidery and textile arts or are doing yeah but want a bit of help with all the technology nightmares. Yeah, and I think even the most experienced person in the world needs help. I mean, I've we all need told help. you that I, I'm not the best on the technology yeah. or, or the marketing side of things. Yeah. But, you know, when you're when you're running a business of any kind, you've got to be able to wear so many different hats and <laughs> yeah. not only kind of manage your time across all these different things, but have an understanding of photography and accountancy and, oh, you know, endless, um, it? marketing and... <laughs> oh god it's yeah no one can be good at everything and we all, I think we all need a little bit of help in some areas so true and but of course you will be able to wear a beautifully embroidered vintage hat won't you on top of everything else <laughs> I don't have time to make anything for myself <laughs> oh dear. if you were going to make yourself a vintage themed embroidered hat um yeah. what are your favorite techniques Jessica what do you like to use obviously you've got the sorts of things that people come to you for help and mm-hmm. commissions with and then the sort of stuff do you do anything just because you like doing it for yourself well I mean the way that I see it most people fall into one of two categories when it comes to their favorite techniques I think some people are very kind of almost mathematically minded and methodical yeah. and they lean towards um, counter techniques yeah. such as cross stitch black work canvas work um you know I call it canvas work but a lot of people call it needlepoint or tapestry yeah. and then there's the other side um which is the more creative approach and that's very much where I sit right um, yeah. it's always my preference to to do freehand embroidery I also love applique because it gives me the freedom to kind of make dresses yeah. and hairstyles yeah. and and you know all that kind of thing on on a flat piece of fabric yeah, um, yeah. I'm a big fan of gold work and silk shading yeah well yeah wow. you know you just spent plenty of time doing that at the royal school no doubt anyway. <laughs> <Yes>. yeah <laughs> yeah you can't beat a bit of a pleak here though can you because it, it, you've immediately got a starting point I often put sort you know we'll, we'll start off on an, an applique now I think about it most of the things I do would have some kind of appliqued background mm. to start off yeah. with. 
I'm lazy. <laughs> well, that was the other thing I was going to say. Not that you're lazy, but that if you're doing silk shading, yeah. you might sense you might spend four hours on a centimetre yeah. square of it. Yeah. You're in a plique. Yeah. You can just apply a bit of fabric to a bit of fabric, and you've covered. You've done that bit. You've covered that area. Get, so. get some back stitch on the go, like I always yeah. do, and off you go. Yay! Absolutely. <laughs> Instant. <laughs> Now we've we've mentioned a few things, so uh, mm-hmm. but I am going to ask you: What would you say yeah. has been the high point of your textile art and embroidery journey so far, Jessica? So, without a shadow of a doubt, working on the royal wedding dress. Um, I mean, when Catherine Middleton married Prince William, that's the that's the royal wedding dress I'm referring to. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, at the beginning of of this conversation, when you read my bio, yeah. it's so interesting listening to somebody else say what you've done because you forget. And, uh, yeah, it's true. You know, true. And, and there are certain things that that are high points that I look back on, and I think even now, I mean, it was 2011, of course, that we yeah. we made the royal wedding dress. Even now, I can't believe that happened. Yeah, yeah. It was just the most incredible experience. And in that same year, 2011, within a couple of months of in fact, I think it was even weeks of the royal wedding. I also met the Queen, Ooh. and that was totally unrelated to us working ah, on the right. royal wedding dress. Yeah. The Queen, as far as I know, the Queen didn't know that the RSN had any involvement with the royal wedding dress. <laughs> but we had an exhibition of embroidery, of gold work embroidery, actually, yeah. in Great in um, Cumberland Lodge, which is in Great Windsor Park, which is of course one of the Queen's residences. Yeah, and she was the patron at the time the patron of the RSN and she requested on a Sunday to go and be the exhibition so I was asked to go and demonstrate part of her coming to view the exhibition it was yeah. a private arrangement there was no yeah. press there or anything All like right, that yeah. um, and I had previously been to one of her garden parties so the RSN having the kind of royal patronage yes yes sort of, you know they, they get a certain amount of tickets for garden parties every year but when you go well certainly when I went to the garden party not being a VIP yeah. um, the queen was just like an ant in the distance yeah right and yeah. I never imagined yeah. that I would have I would shake her hand yeah. and have a one-to-one conversation well, with yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. And it's and it's it just a purely coincidence that us working on the royal wedding dress and me meeting the queen happened happened within a few weeks of each other. Yeah. So definite high points, but also the other thing when I embarked on this career in embroidery, there are certain things that have happened that I could never have predicted. No. That are just weird and wonderful. <laughs> so. For example, teaching, I, I taught for about three years for fine cell work in Wandsworth Prison, male inmates, and that was totally different to anything else yeah. I've ever done. And <laughs> and again, a sort of pinch me moment going into a prison, to, you know, high security prison. Think, what the hell teach, am I doing? A group of men, how yeah. to do needlework. Uh, but it was incredibly rewarding. Yeah. And another thing that, that I did was, gosh, this was years ago now as well, but I was hand double for a film called Bright Star, which is about Keats, the poet, yeah. and his partner, Fanny Braun, who was an avid sewer and ah. enjoyed the one who made her own clothes. <laughs> and it's it's not a very well-known film, um, which is a bit surprising because it's absolutely beautiful. And it was it was directed by Jane Campion, who directed The Piano. Right. So right. one chilly day in... I'm going to say it was probably November time because I remember it was really cold. Yeah. On a farm in Luton, <laughs> I was filmed sewing, basically. My hands were, you know, were filmed really, really up close. And it was just one of those surreal experiences yeah. where you think, I didn't expect that to lead to this. <laughs> No, no, but it, it's it's always fascinating, isn't it? Though, and that's why I like doing this and digging about and trying to, you know, because yeah. everybody, when we look, has all got really interesting things that we've all done always. Yes, you know, yes. and it's just brilliant. For anyone who hasn't seen it, I would really recommend Bright Star. Bright Star, is it all it's, one it's word. Beautiful. Yes, yes, all one word. Um, ben Wishaw plays Keats, and he's wonderful. Right. I'm, I'm absolute rubbish at films. I don't really get round to watching many, but uh, that sounds quite nice. Actually. Well, now's the time. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go out. 
brilliant. I love those highlights. They're great. And obviously many mm. more as well. Now, so we'd usually then go from fabulous highlights to uh, things when There's something didn't, <laughs> didn't yeah. quite go as planned and was a disaster. So have you got any anything that, to, 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 that we can all have a bit of a laugh with as well and cheer ourselves yeah. up? In a nice yeah. way, of course. I mean, I have to say, touch wood, <laughs> I haven't had any disasters with antique textiles. <laughs> yeah, but thankfully. Then, but then from a learning point of view, I haven't touched them until I've known what I've been doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I did have an incident when I was doing my apprenticeship. So back then, we used to do a piece of work which we called Cross Saint and Animal. All right. Yes, yes. I've I've seen some of those. Yes. So historically, we, we always it was always kind of a religious figure with a symbol and an animal. Yeah. In more recent years, people have done more contemporary things such as, you know, things inspired by films such as Harry Potter and stories like Alice in Wonderland. But yeah. back when I did it, it was usually a, re a religious... Those are the ones act. I've seen. And it was the only piece of work that we did over an entire year. Right. So in the first term, we'd do the, the symbol or the cross. Ah, right, yes. Second term, we'd do the figure. Yeah. And in the third term, we'd do the animal. Yeah. So I had done... My one was Joan of Arc. Mm -hmm. And I'd done the symbol... And I'd done the figure, I'd done her. And then it got to the point where I was painting on the design for the animal, <laughs> which is a dove, not a pigeon, as yeah. it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> it does look like a pigeon. <laughs> anyway, I was painting on the design and I spilt a blob of oh. black paint oh, just no. next to the symbol. No. Oh. Yeah. Uh, this piece that I'd already been working on oh, for, like, you know, two months. terms. Oh, yeah. No. <gasps> and um, oh. I remember being in the toilets crying. I'm going to say you'd have just been in fits of tears. Yeah. Oh, dear. So there was no way that I was going to get this black paint out of that fabric. Yeah. So what I ended up doing was painting using kind of greys and silver. <laughs> like a, because the, the symbol is a is like a sword with flames coming out from behind it, which is ah, right. shaded. Yeah, yeah. So I ended up painting around the bottom of the sword where this splodge was, yeah. <laughs> a kind of silvery, smoky effect. And actually it turned out really well because if it hadn't been there, it would have been quite a lot of blank space on the design. Ah, right. So <laughs> there's another silver lining then. <laughs> yes, that was certainly a lesson in oh. that whatever happens, there's always a way of fixing it. Yeah, Even yeah. if, you know, and I'm often, I'm often saying to, to my students, the great thing about embroidery is that you can undo it and redo it. You know, you've not committed to it. It's not like a piece but, of wood, is it, that you've cut it off or you know, a piece yeah. of metal that is now, you, only, you can only fix it if you melt it again or something. Exactly. Yeah, I always or think that. Or a painting yeah. where yeah, you, yeah. you put that brush stroke on, you've committed to it. Um, so, but that was one thing that there was, once, <laughs> I, once I'd spilt it, there was no turning back and I had to find another solution. So <laughs> it was a very good learning exercise, actually. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm not surprised. And then since you've been doing this a long time, what about those dreaded UFOs? Now, for me, they're all, they tend to come from doing workshops, you know, embroidery skill workshops and things I never get around to finishing. But, you know, you must have a cupboard full, have you? Or are you a good girl and finish well, them all off? <laughs> no, I definitely don't finish them all off. I have a lot. I do buy other people's kits. Yeah. If I see a design that I really love. Um, so I've, I've got a box of kits to do. Yeah. Um, but the, long, the longest standing one is probably... When I was a little girl, my auntie bought two printed panels. One says Jessica on it and one says Catherine on it, which is my sister. Yeah. She dutifully and beautifully embroidered the Catherine panel <laughs> and had it framed. There's flowers and various other things around the name as well. Yeah. Never quite got round to mine. <laughs> and so she gave it to me probably <laughs> about... 20 years ago <laughs> to do it yourself there it, there it remains in my ufo box <laughs> i'll probably never do it oh that's brilliant that is can you change it and, and, and do it for your baby uh not probably not unless i call the baby jessica, jessica and that's yeah. gonna be confusing <laughs> jessica the second yes. make her sound like royalty <laughs> And then really, I suppose, Jessica, my kind of final questions, normally about future plans and projects mm. and so on. But obviously at the moment, lots of things have been cancelled for people and you're yes. coming up to the, the birth of your child. So, yeah. you know, is there anything particular that you want to share with us? Or are you just going to see see how things pan out? 
Well, a bit of both. Yeah. I mean, there is an element certainly of kind of going with the flow for the rest of this year. Yeah, yeah. In terms of baby coming along, but in terms of the restrictions we're currently under and not knowing w- when or was how no gradually idea, things yeah. will be lifted. Yeah. Um, but certainly kind of longer term future, I'd love to set up more classes locally yeah um so I'm in West Yorkshire there's a fantastic I'm in Halifax there's a fantastic Mm. museum with a great fashion gallery just down the road from me called the Bankfield Museum oh I love the Bankfield yeah oh it's great isn't it so I'm I'd love I've, I've sort of kind of sown the seeds of of getting in contact with them with a view to longer term maybe doing some classes there designing new classes and kits is something that I'm very keen to do continuing with my online services and growing and developing those and seeing where that goes yeah and the other thing I would love to do again is to combine my worlds and create a line of vintage hair accessories um that people can buy from me yeah or commission me to make for yeah, them. That yeah. might be for weddings or it might just be, you know, for, for people who love dressing up vintage. Like yeah, I'm going to say, because there's lots of people who like dressing up in all sorts of different eras. And um, yeah. yeah, I could see that being a really nice thing as well. You could even do kit kind of things for that as well, couldn't you, if people want yeah, to do that absolutely. sort of thing. Yeah, no, I think that's a really nice idea, that. And also um, workshops for hen parties. Yeah, yeah. And things like that. There's... I'm never short of ideas, no. just short of time. <laughs> yeah, aren't we all? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that's just fabulous. Well, Jessica, as ever, I could carry on with this conversation for the next three weeks. Um, oh. But at some point, we need to, uh, we need to stop. Um, just so wonderful. I'm so pleased that we've finally got our calendars up in, in line and, yeah. uh, and had this conversation. And it's just, I, I think, also, actually, a, a really nice time for you Mm. thank you so much for your time and for you know sharing some really interesting points of view and some some good stories and and some I think some really inspiring ideas in terms of how we can all work together and there is support there you know people may think oh you know it's embroidery it it, it can't work this that and the other It, it it really can it really yeah. can. And yeah. there are people out there to help in all aspects of creating a business around this, getting your hobby going, mm-hmm. whatever. There's, there is, there's people there. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's it's my first foray into the podcast world <laughs> and it's lovely to, to finally speak to you and get to know you as well. Um, and for anybody listening, I'd love to hear from you. Please don't don't be shy about getting in touch you know, if, if you're interested in any of the services I'm offering, then fantastic. But if you just want to have a bit have a bit of a chat and, you know, share your embroidery with me, I would love that too. So anyone listening is very, very welcome to contact me. That's that's brilliant. Um, and, and yeah, I think it's always nice. <clears throat> I know you've got a Facebook page. Stitchery Stories has got a yeah. Facebook page. And it's funny you mentioned about Pinterest because that's the next thing. Because somebody says, oh, oh. You're, on, you're on Pinterest, aren't you, Sue? I said, oh, no, I've never got around to it. So hey, watch out. Stitchery Stories is off on Pinterest as well. So. Yes. I think we need to add a disclaimer here for anyone not on Pinterest. If you go on Pinterest, <laughs> as a result of listening to this, we cannot be responsible for the hours that you lose. It's not our fault. <laughs> fall into a, a rabbit hole of wonderfulness on Pinterest uh, I know exactly <laughs> right hey, I'm, I'm losing my voice right I'm going oh, bless you. So, it's been so lovely speaking to you Jessica you thank too. you so much thank you for having me if you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more then please join the Stitchery Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released it's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and information around this podcast please visit stitcherystories.com. Of course, you can listen to Stitchery Stories on plenty of podcast apps, at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and plenty more besides. You can also ask your smart speaker to play Stitchery Stories podcast too. But wherever you listen, why not leave us a rating and a review to encourage other people to listen too? I very much appreciate you taking the time to do that for me. So that is the end of our Stitchery story for today. Keep stitching, keep smiling and keep creating your very own Stitchery stories.